Welcome to Jesus City Online. My name is Jason Powell, and I'm the pastor of Jesus City Church here in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm so glad that you're joining us for church today to hear one of our messages. Listen, our heart, our goal as a church is to push you closer to Jesus, that you would know God and you would make God known. I invite you to be a part of our church, to be a part of the family. You can just go to our website, go to jesuscitychurch.com, and you can find out about more resourcing and groups really some items to help you be more in love with the Lord, to help you feel encouraged in your relationship with God. But today, the message, I know that God's going to speak to you. I know that God's going to encourage you. And so I ask that you would just listen to it with a ready heart and hang in there. At the very end of our message, I've got some important things that I want you to know about, about the church and how you can be a part of what God is doing here at Jesus City. Ministry Launch ministry launch, the baptism of Jesus. How about we pray before we get started? God, I thank you for this morning. I ask that you'd be here now. As we read your word, speak to our hearts. God, as we look at just what took place on this special day uh, that that Jesus, your son, was baptized, God, I ask that you would allow that, that truth to be impressed upon us this morning. Lord, I thank you for this time, time in your word. And again, we invite your Holy Spirit to be here now. In Jesus' name, amen. Men. So whenever a company wants to launch a new product or open a new location or a new store, they will typically sit down with a marketing team and they'll say, you know, we got to come up with a marketing strategy on how we're going to launch this new product, how we're going to let the world know about this, this new technology or, you know, skincare Tech, whatever it is, you know, you, you got it. It's going to be there. And so they, they put all of these pieces together. Well, they have found throughout the years that one of the most successful components of a, a launch for some type of object is whenever they do something called a partnership launch, where they'll find an individual who has some clout or some type of, you know, notoriety, and they will do a partnership brand deal with them. Now we're familiar because, you know, there's social media today. So you've got Instagram and Facebook and the rest. And so you'll have companies like like Colgate will go, go to an influencer, you know, and have them post on their social media. I use Colgate, you know, or whatever it is. And so, but this is a very effective way of getting the word out is you find someone, you partner with them and you give them a brand deal. The number one brand deal of all time was actually a brand deal back in the eighties where it became one of, uh, really, this has become an empire. This is not just any brand deal. It has become, I mean, multi-billion dollar industry. And it is the very first brand deal with Michael Jordan and Nike for the Nike Air Jordan 1s. Now, I looked it up and I was like, man, I, I kind of you know, remember this just a little bit. But back in 1984, Nike came to Jordan and said, you know what, we want to do a brand deal with you. And he got a little bit of money on the side. But he was able to design his own shoe, right? It was an, a red shoe, black and white. And Jordan wore these shoes during a game there against the Philadelphia 76ers, November 17th, 1984. Now he wore these shoes and it just, it was like a firestorm uh, what happened following because everybody wanted these shoes that Michael Jordan was wearing. Matter of fact, the NBA banned the shoes uh, because they were against code and regulation. And so they became known as the banned shoe. NBA banned him $5,000 a game every time that he wore these shoes. And Nike was like, you know what? It's worth it. Just keep wearing the shoes. You know, it'll turn out for us, and it did. In two months' time, they made $70 million off the sale of these shoes. Like, talk about like a product that takes off, right? $70 million, and today, the Jordan brand uh, is worth $6.6 billion. Talk about the right partnership, right? Nike made a good deal there, you know, partnering with Michael Jordan, where you've got one partnering with the other, and it just skyrockets from there, where this relationship was almost like a handoff. We're going to work together for this common purpose. And that's kind of the exact same concept that happened when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, where it was a partnership deal. It was a collab, so to speak, where John had been doing his ministry for about six months. Now, we have already found out who John the Baptist was. John the Baptist was well-known, you know, back in Jesus's day, and he's pretty well-known now. We know him as the baptizer because that's what he was doing, baptizing people. 
John was also known for some eccentric things about him. Remember, he dressed in camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. Uh, he was also known because he, he ate locust dipped in honey. I'm not sure how you would, you know, talk to John, you know, maybe with his breath, you know, grasshopper legs sticking out a little bit. He's an interesting guy, John the Baptist. He's a cousin of Jesus. John's ministry was unique because he was prophesied about in the Old Testament. John was a, a guy that he came on the scene right before Jesus had his public ministry launch, and his job was really to make a way for Christ himself. John was like a, a red carpet. John was an MC. He was a, a movie trailer before the grand release. John's job was to go out and get the people ready, turning their hearts to God. And God was really blessing this ministry, by the way. John was all the way out in the wilderness and people were, man, they were driving way out there, riding their camels way out there just to go hear him. It said there earlier in Matthew chapter three that all of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him. So he's a hit, you know, like he is famous. Everybody wants to be baptized by John. And John is telling them like, you need to repent and you need to repent. You know, it's like a John Wayne out in the wilderness, lighting people up and people are getting right with God. Their hearts are being turned toward the maker. And this is incredible. It seems like a revival is starting to break out. And as this is happening, lo and behold, Jesus Christ hears about it and he goes out to meet him in the middle of the wilderness. The reason why Jesus was going out there was because this was going to be a handoff. This was like an Olympic track meet where John was taking the baton that he had been running with for God, this ministry that had been so blessed, and he's getting ready to hand it off to Jesus Christ. John's identity was built in the fact that he was only the forerunner of Jesus. He didn't want to make it famous. He didn't want to be well-known. John was happy to play the background. Matter of fact, if you remember... When John saw Jesus come up to him, he said, man, I, I, I don't even deserve to wear or even to carry your sandals. You are so much more important than me. He told the crowds, I baptize you with water. Man, but when, when Jesus comes, when the Messiah comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John knew his place. He knew that he was only there to prepare the way. And he did a good job at it, which by the way, is a good word for me and you. You know, it life is really not about you. I mean, it really is about Jesus Christ. I mean, we, we need to have that settled. Our Christianity, you know, is, is not about you. It's not your name, Eanity. It's not Jason Eanity. You know, it's not Terrence Eanity. You know, it's Christ Eanity. Like it's Christian is our, is our name. That's our focus. It's all about him. And so John is a really good example for me and you about making much of Jesus. What a partnership deal. They come together the handoff happens, and Jesus picks up where John left off. And that's exactly where we come today. But what's unique about today is that we're going to look at an event, almost like the same day that Jordan put those shoes on, and it was all uphill from there. This is a very special day in Bible history, because this is the day that Jesus started his public ministry. You know, have you ever thought about all the missing years of Jesus? Maybe you've read through the Gospels before and you've realized, you know what? Like, how come we don't have the teenage years of Jesus? Like, I want to know, like, what were his friends like? And where did he hang out? Did he play sports? We don't have much information in our Bible about the upbringing, teenage years, the young professional life of Jesus, being a carpenter after Joseph. We don't have those uh, descriptions. But what we do have uh, are these very intentional moments of when Jesus said, I've been in the silence for all these years, but now it's time to make it public. This is a day that I wish I knew the day, but this is a day that changed the course of human history because it's the day that Jesus revealed who he really was and what he came to do. And so are you there in Matthew chapter three? Look at the start to the public ministry of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. Now, John would have prevented him saying, man, I, I shouldn't be baptized by you, but you, you should baptize me. He says, you should do it to me. But Jesus said, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. So John's a pushover, all right? 
Just one sentence from Jesus was enough. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The public announcement, the ministry launch of Jesus Christ. I wish I could have been here this day. Some pretty epic things were happening uh, all around them, not only getting to see Jesus be baptized and meet John the Baptist himself, but you're seeing the skies ripped open and God speaking audibly. I mean, how amazing would that be? I would have loved to be there. What we're going to find out today is this, is why this matters. You know, what was really happening here and why does it matter to me and you? You know, three points this morning as we consider what this means. One, what, what this meant. Number one, it was a ministry announcement. So this was the announcement, as I've already hinted at, that Jesus Christ was officially here. The Messiah has landed. He's come to save you of your sins. He's come on mission. It's a ministry announcement. The second thing we see is that this was a, the, an anointing of the Spirit, that this is the start to when the Holy Spirit of God came and anointed Jesus for the work of ministry. And then thirdly and lastly, this is the approval from the Father. Where the Father himself from heaven speaks audibly and all those surrounding get to hear not a tyrant from the sky, but the voice of a father saying, this is my boy, this is my son, my beloved son. And with him, I'm so pleased. Today, I'm hoping you walk away feeling that, that same in your heart. Today, we're going to end on the love of God. How much God loves you. You being a son or a daughter this morning of God. You could almost hear the Lord saying that over your life. I don't know if anybody ever told you that already. If your father ever told you that. Your parents ever told you that. But when you get adopted into the family of God, that same father would look at you and say, You're my daughter. You're my son my beloved son, my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. All those words will change your life when you have your identity with God. Let's go back to the first point, the ministry announcement. Verse 13 through 15, here's the announcement that Jesus is finally here. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now, John would have prevented him saying, hey man, uh, you should baptize me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. But Jesus says, you just better let this happen because I, I need to fulfill why I came. This public showing, this launch uh, was very, very important. You see, what's happening here is that we have got early Jewish believers who have been waiting on the Messiah. John came as the forerunner. It's fulfillment of prophecy. Now Jesus is on the scene to take the mantle, take the baton and run with it seeing what God had planned up ahead. Now, in the course of all of this, what's vitally important is understanding why Jesus had to be baptized to begin with. Have you ever thought about that? Like, why, why did Jesus need to be baptized? I mean, Jesus was not a sinner. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, remember? Last week, John was telling them to turn to God. He was telling them to forsake God. Their, their wrongs and turn their life over to Jesus or turn their life toward the Lord. That's what the baptism of repentance was, that they would say, look, we're getting baptized saying, my life is being turned to God. Jesus didn't need to do that. He didn't need to repent. Jesus was a sinless, perfect individual, which I'm sure you moms raising boys would appreciate what Mary got to experience. You know, I can only imagine what moms talked about when they got together. So tell me about your sons. How are they doing? Oh, my sons are a mess. You know, they're making all these mistakes. Then Mary's over here waiting. You know, Mary, tell us about your son. How is he? Well, you know, he's perfect. You know, like I, <laughs> it'd be pretty amazing. Um, Jesus did not need to repent. He was perfect. Uh, God in flesh but yet he goes and he gets baptized. Jesus actually tells John why he needed to be baptized. John is a little put off by it. He felt uncomfortable baptizing Jesus, but Jesus says, let this happen because 
It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Maybe your Bible translation says it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. This Greek word fulfill uh, is kind of a, a word that implies like we need to get it done in order. We need to accomplish what has been foretold. It reminds me, my sons have these connect the dots. You remember when you were younger, you've got the connect the dots where it's like a hundred, you know, little dots with numbers on them. You take your crayon and you outline it, you know, and the further you outline it, the more you see the picture. You know, Jesus was telling John, listen, bro, we're like on step five, all right? Like we can't jump numbers here. We have to fulfill this thing. I've come to finish this thing. And so we need, this needs to happen in line. I'm fulfilling prophecy about you being the forerunner and prophecy about me being the Messiah. And so you need to let this happen. John says, okay, no problem. I see the picture. I see what you're saying. So Jesus gets baptized. Everybody there gets to see it. They start understanding it. Now, as believers, we back up a little bit and we go, man, this is pretty interesting because Jesus' baptism is a foretelling of what was going to happen later in his ministry. Because his baptism, you know, going under the water and coming up out of the water was very similar to his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his ministry and he was baptized at the end of his ministry. Matter of fact, it was the brothers that said, hey, can we sit on your right hand and on your left? And Jesus said, can you be baptized with the baptism I've, I've got coming? And they're like, uh, no, you know. Jesus was baptized in death and life, back to life again. So this is a, an early showing of what he was about to do. So this announcement takes place. The second thing that we see, not only just the, the public announcement, but now we see the Spirit's anointing. And I, I really like this idea. So look at verse 16. Jesus is baptized. Immediately he goes up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. Which, by the way, that gives the idea of literally like the sky being torn open. Like it, it means something rolled back or exposed in the original Greek. And so the the sky is visibly changed and something starts coming down. You're like, is that a UFO? What is this? But it's a dove. Look at verse 16. It says, he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. What a moment. The spirit of God descending down, resting upon Jesus himself. Now, it's pretty important for me to understand why this took place because Jesus was fully man, 100% man, yet 100% God. But everything that Jesus did and was able to do uh, was because of the, the Spirit's anointing on his life, the filling of the Spirit. That is why he was able to do the miraculous that we see. You're like, well, help me understand that, Jesus. Next verse, Matthew 4, 1, it says, when Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. The Spirit of God came and filled Jesus, all right? So we're talking the, the second person of the Trinity here, right? So we've got God, the, the Spirit. He comes and he fills Christ. And that word led in the Greek for chapter four, verse one, uh, is this idea of a sail on a boat. I don't know if you've ever been on a sailboat before. Years ago, uh, I was out and we got on a catamaran and this catamaran was just sitting in the water and they started hoisting up the sail. And as soon as that sail went up and the wind started to blow, you know, it made like that whoosh sound and the, the sail filled up and all of a sudden we were off, you know, and, and we're starting out there. And it was amazing to see that when the, the sail just opened itself and yielded itself to the wind, what the wind was able to do. Christ was anointed with the Spirit of God. He availed himself to the Spirit of God. He opened the sails of his life and he's like, direct me where you want me to go. Take my life. Direct me. I will follow. I will go. And we see that in verse one of chapter four, that he goes and he gets led into the, to the wilderness. Later, Jesus talks about the Spirit being upon him. In Luke chapter four, it says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to send me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus told the Pharisees, um, it's by the spirit of God that I drive out demons. Peter, matter of fact, in Acts chapter 10, tells me and you that everything Jesus did was because of the spirit's filling. Acts 10, 37 Peter speaking says, you know what happened through Judea, beginning in Galilee? 
after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, verse 38. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus, fully man, completely filled with the Spirit of God, walking around healing people, setting people free. He's the Messiah there. Now, if Jesus, why this matters, if Jesus needed to be filled with the Spirit of God to make the impact that he did, don't you think that you need to be? Amen. Yeah. Like, I mean, just sit here for a second. You know, like, if Jesus needed it, Amen. the Spirit of God upon him, filling him, don't you think it's a good idea for your life? I feel like we talk about God the Father all the time. Like, we pray, God, we think about God the Father. We talk about God the Son. We talk about, we put him on buildings, on shirts, you know, Jesus is here. We talk about Jesus but I feel like we don't really give too much attention to the Holy Spirit. I feel like he's the forgotten God where we don't really think about what he's doing. We don't really think about his presence in our life, but yet it was such an integral part of what Jesus was doing. This was the fuel to the tank for his entire ministry. What I would want you to do is start to realize that anything good that's coming out of you as a Christian it's not because of you. Amen. It's because the Holy Spirit of God is in you. Amen. You've heard of the fruits of the Spirit before, haven't you? Amen. Yeah, the book of Galatians where it says like love and joy and what are the rest? Peace, patience, and uh-oh, we're getting lost. Yeah, you there they are. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, what you're telling God is, God, would you come make a home in me? And the Bible tells us that God comes and he makes a home in your heart. It's Jesus that, that moves in. The Holy Spirit of God moves in. You get filled with the Spirit of God, where he's not just with you, but he's in you. When you've got the Spirit of God residing within you, he's empowering you on a daily basis. This is really what it means to be a Spirit-filled believer. You know, you've got a lot of people out there really good at religion, really good at keeping the, the laws, but they're void of the Spirit. But yet the Spirit was so vitally important in Jesus' life. You, I just want you to just, just focus a little bit more on the Spirit's involvement with you, His guidance in your life, His equipping. The Bible tells us that He's the one that is reminding you of the things that God has said. He's the one growing you in your spirituality. Whenever you sense a little bit of conviction and you're like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this or I'm not at the right spot, you'll, the Holy Spirit of God, he's guiding you, he's growing you, he's maturing you. There's more at work in you than you realize. The Spirit of God anointed Jesus, and the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes in you, where he's with you. He doesn't ever leave you. He doesn't ever forsake you. He's growing you inside and out. What a blessing it is. So I, I see this and I go, man, that's, that's pretty cool that Jesus was anointed with the Spirit of God. Lord, would you help me understand that more? Would you help me be more reliant on the Spirit's moving in my life? And that's what I want you to do. I want you to be more like that sail on that boat, that you would be a little more yielding to the Spirit's moving in your life. Like, God, I, I, I'm, I'm open. I'm available. Where, wherever you want me to go, wherever you want me to, to move, or what you want me to say, I'm, I'm willing, Lord. I'm willing. Fill me. Use me to be filled with the Spirit of God. The third thing that I see here is that not only is it a ministry announcement, not only is it a, a moment where the Spirit is filling him, but now, very uniquely, it's time when the, the Father himself gives an audible approval of his Son. Verse 17, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. I wonder what it would have sounded like to be there watching the event and then out of nowhere, you hear an audible voice from the heavens. 
This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Now we live next to Maxwell. And so they're like these, these jets that fly over on a regular basis, you know, and as soon as they break the sound barrier, it's loud. It's like, oh man, like, I wonder what it sounded like. I wonder what the voice of God, you know, in the Psalms, it says the voice of God breaks all the cedars of Lebanon. And so there's a strength behind it. There's a might behind it. Moses got to hear the voice of God. Here people, these observers, they got to hear it. What did it sound like? What, what was the tone of his voice? What were the words here? Three things that we hear and three things we get from the Father's phrase. We see attention, we see approval, and we see affection. Three things. Attention, affection, and approval. You know, these three things are so vital in the Christian life. Attention, to know that God is paying attention to me. God was there, Jesus on earth, and in a moment, God with a, a sentence reminds his own son, hey, I'm watching you. I'm watching you. I see what's going on down there. I'm not distant. I'm not unaware. So many people live their life like God is completely cut off. He doesn't know what's happening. God, are you even paying attention to me? Do you not see what happened or how this turned out? Where I'm going? God, where are you at? And God from heaven, ah, I'm here. This is my son, whom I'm, oh, the attention of God. Jesus was reminded that his father was watching. The second, he says, this is my son, my beloved son, the affection of God. Before I was a Christian, I had the wrong view of God. You know, I kind of had this thought that God was pretty mean and angry all the time which is pretty common, you know, I'm from California and there are a bunch of heathens out there and uh, the best of the best. And so um, I, I knew I was in the wrong. I knew that I'd been sinning. I knew that I had been living a life contrary to God. And so I didn't really want to go to God because I was like, man, I don't, you know, he's not going to be happy with me. And I quickly found out that there's more to God than what my little mind had assumed him to be. As soon as I, I found myself at a church that God had set up and I heard this gospel message that despite my sin, despite my wrongs, that there was a God in heaven that loved me and cared about me with affection, not just a fake affection, but there was real love more than I could comprehend, deeper than the depths of the ocean, higher than the, the heights of heaven, new and every morning like the love of God for me. And guess what? It broke this heart immediately. Immediately, I'm like, I don't know a love like that. I don't know a love like that that would love me in my mess and love me in the dark, love me so much to turn my life around. I mean, there's a side of God that, yes, he is, you shouldn't trifle with God. There's a side of God where he's just and right. And the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God or, or of God in general. And, and that, that's a scary thing. But there's another side over here that when you know God as a son or a daughter, oh, it's all love, baby. He loves you. He loves you in an amazing way. Jesus heard about the affection of God. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Who I'm well pleased. Why this is important is because I feel like in a day and age where we, we seek for attention and approval and affection, from so many other sources and always lets us down, but yet we continue to do the same thing. And we need to really be reminded that all the attention you need, all the affection you crave, and all the approval you're trying to get, it comes from your heavenly father. His voice over your life. You see, God said this over his son that day, but Jesus tells us later in in his writing, he said, Jesus says this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. This is the beautiful thing. When you get adopted into the family of God and you become a son or a daughter because of Christ, what he's done for you, because you, when you get adopted in, all of this same affection and attention and approval that God gave his son, it comes towards you. Like it comes towards you. This isn't just something just because Jesus is special. I am now a son or a daughter, right? Like you, you, I'm not a daughter, but you know what I mean. Um, I'm a son. Um, but you get the blessings is my point. 
where you get to experience the love of God. You get to experience the attention of God. Like right now in your life, God sees what's going on. You are his son or his daughter. If you've asked Christ to come into your life, you've got the Holy Spirit of God in you, he's paying attention to you. He sees you. He knows your life. He knows your needs. Nobody else might, but he is. The affection of God, he says over your life, I love you. I love you. It says it's the loving kindness of God that brings us to repentance. It says in Micah, he pulls us with bands of loving kindness. God loves you, friends. He loves you. He cares about you. Stop looking for it other places because you have it in God. And then the approval. Like you don't need to go out there and get a big old career and try to get other people to tell you they're proud of you and, and try to get attention from mom or dad or, you know, to get your name in lights, a blue check mark on social media. You, you, we try to get so much, but you don't have to do all of that because you're a heavenly father. He goes, I, I'm proud of you. I care about you. I love you. I feel like the Christian life is so much easier when my heart is settled in whose I am. You see, a lot of time we're trying to get people to understand who I am. I want you to know who I am and what I can do. Let go of that. Let go of that. Let your heart be settled in whose you are. I belong to my, my heavenly father. He loves me. Therefore, I, I feel I don't need to get it from other people. He's paying attention to me. So I don't need to try to get attention from other people. His affection for me is so enough that I don't have to desperately claw at it from other people. The love of God. Oh, to be there this day, to hear the Father say, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Because He's saying it over you today. It's still reverberating today. Would you hear it in your ears? This is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. To be in the family of God. To, to be adopted in and brought in, to, to know the love of God. There's nothing else like it. This was an important day in Jesus' baptism. We get to see the handoff from John the Baptist. We get to see this partnership better than Nike and Michael Jordan. You know, we, we see this handoff take place and it literally changed the course of human history, this event did, because it was the marker of a ministry launch. Jesus is now public and he's come to do what he said he was going to do, to die for the sins of the world, to redeem you and me, to let us know what life is really about. Life here and life eternal, to have the love of God in our hearts, the Holy Spirit pouring it in, Romans 5.5. 5. There's so many beautiful parallels here. And today is so simple though. It's so simple. God loves you. He cares about you. When you walk out the building today, you'll see it on the glass. It says there's a God in heaven that loves you. It's here. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows your name, and I'm going to close in prayer. Can I pray that God would just impress this on your heart today? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I'm so thankful, God, for this truth here, that we get to somehow be grafted in, as it were, to this blessing to be adopted into the family. Jesus, you tell us that we can pray our Father in heaven. You tell us we can cry out, Abba, Father. You tell us that we are... We are the children of God. And because I'm a child, I know who my heavenly father is. My heavenly father loves me, cares about me. He's guiding me, fills me with his spirit. Oh Lord, I thank you today that we've got these truths that settle our hearts, that we don't have to go out into a world that's confused. We can go and show them what it means to have a heart settled in you. Lord, I pray that you would break free the bonds of our life of trying to keep up with everybody else and try to build an identity when we know that you love us. You care about us. You're paying attention to us. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you, God. And I lift my friends to you. And I again pray this week you would work this message deep into their hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for 
joining us today at Jesus City. I hope that message really encouraged you or challenged you in your relationship with the Lord to draw near to Him and to use your life for Him. Hey, would you go to our website? You'll find a lot more resourcing and things to encourage you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Just go to JesusCityChurch.com. It's there that you'll find out about events that are happening locally and small groups that are available to you. Other resourcing available online to, again, help you in your relationship with God. You'll even find a place where if the Lord leads you, you can financially support the work that's happening here in Montgomery, Alabama, or wherever you are watching. I want to ask one last favor that you would help get the word out, that you would like, follow, or share the message that you heard today. So we just want to say we love you, we thank you, and we are so blessed that you're part of the Jesus City family. God bless.